When I was at Dhamma Sati with John Fuang, one time we received a letter from a meditator in Singapore. He's talking about how he practiced meditation in daily life. He said whatever he was doing, watching TV, engaging with work, tried to see everything as inconstant, stressful, not self. And John Fung had me right back. He said, tell him not to look at things outside. Don't place blame on things outside, that they're, they're not constant or reliable. Turn around and look at who's calling them inconstant, because that's where the real trouble is. That's where the real blame lies. In other words, our, in other words, our mind changes very quickly, and our mind is very unreliable, so unreliable, so quick and to change. As the Buddha said, he couldn't find a good simile for how quick it is. So this is where the real problem lies. It's not that things are inconstant, it's that the mind is unreliable. And the mind is also shaping our experience. As the Buddha said, all phenomena are rooted in desire. Everything we experience is shaped by our desires, which come out in, both in terms of our intentions, what we want to do, and our attention, what we want to, pay atten what we want to look at and pay attention to outside, what's important to us. This is what we've got to train, because if our desires go out of control, our intentions get out of control, and the way we look at the world gets out of control. This is what the Buddha realized on the night of his awakening. It's the way we pay attention to things and the intentions that we act on. That's what shapes what we're going to experience. And all of these things come out of desire. The question was, is there a way to put an end to that desire? And if so, can you use desire to put an end to it? Because otherwise you're stuck. You can't use nirvana to reach nirvana. You've got to use what you've got. And what you've got, of course, is just a lot of desires. This is why the path has two factors that relate to desire. One is right resolve. And the other's right effort, right resolve, is resolving to renounce sensuality, to be resolved on non-ill will, in other words, good will, or at least equanimity, and on harmlessness, compassion. These are the desires we want to foster. And then based on that, then the, there's the desire of right effort, the desire to prevent unskillful qualities from arising in the mind, to get rid of any ones that already have arisen, to give rise to skillful qualities, and then to maintain them and bring them to their full development. But that first set of right resolves, renunciation, non-ill will, harmlessness, these things are related. Because our fascination with sensuality, our fascination with sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, and all the things we want in the world outside, that leads to a lot of conflict. As with so many things in the world, if you gain, somebody else loses. If they gain, you lose. As the Buddha said, one of the drawbacks of sensuality is that you see, compares it to a crow or hawk flying off with a piece of meat, and other crows and hawks flying after it to take the piece of meat away. And if it doesn't let go, it's going to get torn up, like a man climbing up in a tree to get some fruit. And he's up in the tree eating the fruit, and another man comes along. He says, well, I can't climb up a tree, but I've got an axe. I can cut the tree down. And if the first man doesn't get out of the tree very quickly, he's going to break an arm or a leg. There's always so much to go around. And if your desires are focused on sensual pleasures, you're going to find yourself in conflict with somebody else whose desires are focused on sensual pleasures. This is where renunciation is a type of goodwill. In other words, you're going to look for happiness in a place that nobody else is going to lay claim to. 
and you're not taking anything away from anyone else. Think of that image the Buddha had before his awakening of the world as being like a stream of water, with the water's drying out and the fish are fighting one another for that last bit of water. Of course, they're all going to die. Nothing gets accomplished, and there's just a lot of struggle. Everything is, as the Buddha said, he saw everything is being laid claim to. There's no place he could look for happiness that wasn't laid claim to. But that's when he realized he had to turn around and look back inside. And so as we're working here on a happiness that comes from within that's not based on sensuality, it's based on your inner sense of the form of the body, which can be very intense, the pleasure that comes as you focus on the breath like this. But it doesn't conflict with anybody else. Nobody else is going to try to come in and get your sense of your breath. As I said this morning, other people can see you breathe, they can hear you breathe sometimes. We've had nights here where one person is breathing very loudly and everybody else is meditating on that person's breath. But it's not the same as the sensation of your own breath element in your body. Nobody else can sense that. Nobody else can take it away. And you can develop that as much as you like and find as much pleasure in that as you like. And it's not going to harm anybody. This is why renunciation and goodwill go together. All three forms of right resolve go together like that. This means where we pay attention is not so much outside, it's more inside. Figure out, figure out what else the mind is doing, because after all, even though we're meditating and looking for pleasure inside, the fact that we are human beings with bodies that need to eat means that we're still placing some burden on the rest of the world. This is why even though the practice of generosity and virtue and meditation are relatively harmless, still you're not totally free from harm and you're not totally free from having to compete with others until you reach the deathless. So this is why we don't stop simply with a sense of well-being that comes from focusing on the breath. We try to figure out what is it in the mind that keeps getting in the way of our understanding what the deathless is or having an experience of what it is. That's what insight is for. And again, it's a matter of learning to look at your desires. The desires that the Buddha says lead to becoming, taking on an identity in a particular world of experience. To what extent are you still doing that? Because as long as that kind of desire is still going, it's still got to feed. It's still got to cling. How can you learn how to let go of these things? Well, the best way to let go of the Buddha says is to develop some dispassion for them, which means looking at them in terms of not only what you want out of them, but also learning to see that the harm that's done by going for various states of being either harm to yourself, harm to others. It's still there on a subtle level. And then you ask yourself, what am I getting out of this? What is, what's the allure? What keeps making me want to come back for it? And try to see what are the images the mind paints for itself for those pleasures. As you're working on concentration, you don't focus first on the concentration, you focus on everything else. This is one of the reasons why we practice concentration to begin with, to give the mind a good place to stay where it can look at everything else and see the mind in action as it starts going for things and seeing the bait that it lays for itself and why it goes for the bait and why it keeps turning a blind eye, paying no attention to the harm that's being done. It's because our desires don't want to see the harm. This is where the negative meditations of the Buddha will give us sometimes, like seeing the, the contemplation of food, the contemplation of the unattractiveness of the body. We eat every day. We see it as a very innocent activity. We've got our bodies going every day. We see the simple fact that we've got a body is perfectly innocent. 
And there's still some drawbacks there. There's still some weight being placed on others. I want to see why are we still so attached to these things? Because we think these are the only things we can do to find happiness. Eat, maintain the body. The Buddha is saying something really radical. There's a happiness that doesn't have to depend on these things. But it requires that you look very carefully at the drawbacks of these things so that you stop going for them. And the mind can then open up to other possibilities. This is one of the big problems with what's called secular Buddhism. It doesn't have any imagination. It says, well, this is the world we're in, so this is the world we've got to learn how to accept. And that's it. And the Buddha has you imagine there's something better, because there is something better. But you're not going to find it until your imagination is open enough and wide enough to admit that possibility. So we're retraining our desires so that we can change our intentions, where we look for happiness, and change our attention, how we look at things. So then instead of leading to more suffering, it leads away. So this, in John Fung's terms, is where the blame lies. It's the way we act on certain intentions and the way we pay attention to things. These are things we've got to change. That means giving some more imagination to our desires. Because we're looking for happiness in a place that we've never seen before. So allow your imagination to imagine that, that there's a happiness that doesn't have to weigh on anybody at all. No conflict, no harm. A real state of peace. And learn to see that as something really worth desiring.